So um, Caroline already told you a lot about me, but I, I, I'd like to just share that, you know, my history, I didn't know, I, I didn't grow up knowing my history at all. And, and recognizing that's all part of that um, colonial um, mind construct uh, uh, of, you know, assimilating Indigenous people into uh, a new way of living. And um, maybe that's that's okay, but maybe it's not really because we're kind of in a pickle. <laughs> we, based on us, um, you know, keeping uh, this um, pattern. And that's what I've recognized because we are nature, we are living within patterns. And so what we can do is uh, repattern ourselves. So part of my patterning or my programming was um, from my my next door neighbor in in Squamish was from Ireland, and she actually taught me all of the native plants. So she introduced me to our older brothers and sisters. So I'm very grateful for that programming or that imprint because it's created such a deep love for me as a young child playing in the forest and and feeling safe there um and then you know um the other part of it is uh because i didn't know my ancestry i i i feel like the 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 plants actually became my elders and and the more that i um walk this path of learning and understanding and being, you know, uh, curious, just like a child, I'm still being curious. What is going on in my living world? Who are all these creatures and species that live with us? And what is my responsibility as the two legged in, in this incredible miracle that we are living on this planet? So, um, Knowing our history, I feel, is important. And, and I always share that little bit with, with, the, with the students or the children because I encourage them to know their own stories. And then what are the stories of the people of the land that have been taking care of what we call Vancouver? I'm here in Vancouver on the Squamish, Slaywood, Tooth and Musqueam Nation. So um, what are their stories? And and knowing that I'm not of one of those nations, how can I be a good guest on this land? So this image is a painting by George Littlechild. That's just to help me to remember to tell you that little bit of story. And um, what, part why I love this image is it, it's of a beautiful woman who's very proud of who she is. And, and she's colorful, she's full of life. And color is really important for us to wear color, it impacts us. Again, I'm nature and, and color is a reflection of nature. So all there, there's all these kind of weavings um, that I always bring into the teachings that have to do with our senses. It has to do with um, how we take in information and how it makes us feel. So children's art, anybody's art really, is a great, um, practice in how we get to know plants. We look at the detail, we see those patterns that I was just talking about. Um, we see the intricacy, this, um, and sometimes we're actually looking inside our bodies. So we can actually, in, in some of the um, sort of modalities, it's called the um, signature, the doctrine of signature, where we're actually looking at foods that kind of tell, that show us what it looks like inside our body that are actually corresponding to how that affects our health, how it might have an affinity to a certain organ system. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the slides. So I love children's art. It's a really good practice for us to, to slow down and, and to get to know our living world. And then this image is taken up at Big White. Um, you know, it's important that we have the seasons and we call in the snow. So usually around November, anybody that I'm, you know, I'm sharing with or teaching, I'm reminding them, ask for snow, ask for snow. And, you know, growing up in Squamish, we had lots of snow, but that's not the case today. So we can see these changes and that's, you know, um, one of the gifts of getting older is that we, we see these and we witness these changes. So we also want a lot of snow so we have a snowpack. 
So we have water to feed the gardens that hopefully more of us are growing now that we realize in this time that we're in a fragile place because we're, we don't have food security or we don't have food sovereignty, which then you know brings up who are all those plants around us or where are those indigenous plants that Caroline talked about that are not in our landscape anymore? And what, what brought to mind for me as I've been teaching in the last couple of years is how do those plants shape us in the relationship to the land, just like the indigenous people who have lived on this land? Did they were they being informed? Were they receiving teachings and how to walk in a good way, how to be a good two-legged and recognize that we have responsibilities, right? That we build relationship and that we have practices of reciprocity. So not too long ago, I heard Linda Gilkinson talk and she talked about having at least 50% indigenous plants in our urban landscape so that we have lots of insects and we have bees and butterflies and birds and bats. So, you know, um, uh, insects, they're adaptable. Some ca cannot survive that adaptability and others will adapt. So my question would be to us, how are we going to adapt as we move forward? Right. And um, again, how does that food source shape us in our relationships? So um, this is a really big weed. Um, and, and the reason I kind of say it kind of with a smirk on my face is that um, a lot of the cottonwood it gets caught, uh, cut down um, because it's like, oh, we don't want that. That's a menace. That tree's a menace in our cities or, oh, it's taking my view. I can't see the river or the lake. And um, they're instrumental in shading the river so that the temperature of the river does not go above four degrees so that the salmon can swim up that, that river to continue its cycle, its life cycle of death and rebirth and life. So um, our, our cottonwood has an amazing medicine that we get from the buds. So this is prior to those these buds opening up, going into leaf. And right now we should be able to find some cottonwood somewhere from about December until February. And you can see they're, these are beautiful, they're healthy. Um, you know, what, one of the, the gifts of the cottonwood is that after windstorm, uh, she is a giver. Her broken branches will be, you know, on, on the earth for us to then go and do the harvest. So this is a good practice versus us taking. And of course, we can ask permission when we go and do a harvest. So we always want to do an honorable harvest. We're asking permission. We're leaving an offering and we're only taking what we need. So these cottonwood buds, they're antimicrobial and they're antibacterial. And you can see the brown, that little bit of brown in this image, that is the medicine that I'm going to infuse into some kind of oil. And traditionally as first people of what we refer to as Turtle Island, we would infuse that in bear grease or deer grease. And you know, now today in the modern time, I'm infusing it in olive oil or sunflower oil or grapeseed oil. But I never infuse it in an oil that is not life-giving. So a lot of my practice for myself and what I share with others is to look at what do I value? And I value life. I value all life. And for instance, canola, um, it grows in the prairies on millions and millions of acres. And because there's only one species of plant or very few species of plant, there's not a lot of insects. And that then in, uh, affects the songbirds that are migrating across our incredible country and continent. And they're underweight now. So I, I really only want to support things that are life giving. Um, and so I'm always and, and that's also part of this teaching is, you know, recognizing everything that we we choose to do has an impact on our living world. So 
I'm going to put the medicine in a jar. And, and usually I would just put one part plant to two parts oil and I would let it sit for four weeks. And after four weeks, the oil or that grease traditionally would um, extract out that medicine that I can now use for my skin. I can use it when I get sunburns. I can use it when I get cuts. So it's like a polysporin, right? I can mix it, also melt it with some beeswax and make a healing skin salve, right? I can put the oil on my joints where I might have some arthritis. So it helps with pain relief. But you have to ask yourself, what's causing the arthritis? What is going on? What am I eating? How am I feeling? How is my mental health? How is my emotional health that's causing the arthritis, right? So that's part of the medicine wheel teaching that we are physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual as the two leggeds. So what a beautiful gift that the cottonwood gives us. And so our reciprocity is making sure the cottonwood is here with us, who is cleansing the water, right? Shading the, those rivers that I was talking about that offer us some food and some medicine because we can actually get um, food from the inner bark of the cottonwood tree. And in a beautiful book called Black Elk Speaks, he speaks of the time in the 1850s as he was witnessing the women gathering the inner bark to feed the horses on the prairies. So we find cottonwood all over North America, all over Turtle Island. So this image here is uh, on moss. And um, one of my inspirations is um, uh, Robin Wall Kimmer, who wrote a book called Gathering Moss. And then her second book is called Braiding Sweetgrass. And, and the moss has a lesson for us. How can we be like the moss that holds the water, that caretakes the water, that becomes a home for other insects and only takes up a small amount of space? And in Robin's book on braiding sweetgrass, she is bringing a metaphor in this teaching of scientific knowledge, which is one braid, another braid of indigenous ways of knowing. And then the third braid is plant wisdom. So we want to braid these three pathways or these three teachings or three ideologies or three, you know, ways of looking and bring them together as we move ourselves into the future. Oh, this did this today too. And then I was like, what happened there? Oh, there we go. Okay, good. Um, I just have to push a different arrow. It's going now go this way. <laughs> Um, so here's, you know, uh, and this is one of our native plants. Some people would think of it as a weed. It's showing up in the spring. So we're going to start to see this soon. We might have it in our grass. If you are growing a lawn, I would suggest that you grow a lawn that is very diverse with many types of species. So have grass in there, have clover, have yarrow. This is yarrow. Um, have dandelion, have plantain, have chickweed. So then you've got food for the insects and then you've got food and medicine for yourself and you still have a beautiful green space if that's you know what um, you like to see because that too that is an imprint right I saw forests when I was a kid so I love seeing the forest right but depending on where we grow up that's the imprint that or the program that um, you know sort of makes us feel comfortable or feel safe so the yarrow is a very old plant um, dating back to at least the 62,000 years ago it was found on a, a Neanderthal man in um, some caves in northern Iraq. And this is at a, um, a labyrinth of over by um, Renfrew community, uh, Renfrew Ravine. So if you go there, there's a beautiful labyrinth and you can see it looks sort of like a feather or a fern. And um, this is a beautiful green to eat in the spring that has a little bit of bitterness to it. And we find yarrow all over the planet. So if your ancestry is from Europe, then this is what your ancestors were eating was this plant, the yarrow. Um, aqua, what's it called? Uh, aqueous, 
Aqueus millifolium. I'm not so good at my, my Latin names, but Latin names help us to for sure identify a plant. So always make sure you really know what plant that you're going to be eating or making medicine with. Um, and so this is also a reminder of eating in the seasons. So as any, you know, um, cultural uh, nations, we would have had to have eaten in the, se the seasons, right? It really wasn't until the invention of refrigeration, I guess, and supermarkets that we, and, and moving food all over the planet, right? Food has become such a big commodity and it's something we always have to buy. But I'm, I'm a big um, proponent of, of supporting local or growing my own because that's where that food insecurity is right now that, you know, we're, we're a bit vulnerable because we don't have food security um, because we're not feeding ourselves. So, you know, I think 2020 for me was that, um, that insight of, wow, we're expecting someone in another part of the planet to feed us when we can, we can feed ourselves. Um, and so Yarrow um, again, is that reminder to eat in the seasons, which I think is tied with our health. And then here's her beautiful flower that's amazing um, for pollinators. It also works as a biological control in your garden. So it's going to attract the carnivore insects that are going to eat the herbivore insects that are eating your lettuce or your greens. And, and another plant that's even more um, in, in the research that's supposed to be even more effective is your sweet alyssum. So Yarrow, I can um, take the flower or the leaf and I can make some beautiful teas. It's going to be good for my lungs. It's going to help with cramping. So if we're, you know, having uh, any kind of cramping or menstrual cramping, that can be really helpful. Um, and this plant also has a lot of minerals. And I'm gonna talk about minerals in a few minutes. So yarrow is a really important plant for our ecosystem because it's feeding so many bees and butterflies and, and um, other insects to you know, access either nectar or pollen. And we know our insects are starting to die off right? The, that's what the research is starting to show us. And, I, you know, I'll tell you when we were kids and we would go on a road trip, uh, the front grill of our truck or our camper or the, you know, the car was full of insects. And last year I went up to, um, up to Lillooet. That's a good five hours drive. So 10 hours, over 10 hours. And there was, you know, a handful of bugs on the front of my car when I came home. So the, here we can see these changes that are happening in our living world over time. So another um, beautiful plant that sometimes we think of as a weed, we're like, I didn't want horsetail. Um, Equius uh, artensas, I believe that's how I, I say it. Arvenzies, Arvenzies. Um, uh, here's a, a plant that indicates that there's water on the site, right? And um, it's a prehistoric plant that was as big as, you know, trees during the time of the dinosaur. And again, we want to we want to always harvest when the plant is at its pristine time. So uh, a beautiful book. And if someone could even put that in the chat, it's called The Boreal Herbal by Breverly Gray is a beautiful book. Um, so the Boreal Herbal by Beverly Gray, and it will, it'll talk about when to harvest. It will show you how to make some of the medicines that I'm going to quickly run through with you. Uh, she will give you recipes on how to cook with those wild weeds like dandelion and chickweed and plantain and, um, and uh, what, what are the stories? What is the medicines? And, and how do we really build that relationship? And um, so horsetail, I would only harvest when it's around 12 inches high. 
or 20 centimeters. Because as it gets bigger and ages, the, the whorls or the like the leaf structure or the whorls as they're called, they get heavy and they start to um, irritate your kidneys if you actually ingest them, right? But you can use them for scrubbing your pots and they were used as sandpaper at one time. Vinegar extracts out the minerals um, we find silica in horsetail. So that's really good for our nails and our bones and our teeth and our hair. But minerals are also really important for our endocrine system. So that's our hormones, right? So if we're having a hard time or challenged by our hormones, then maybe we need more minerals in our diet. And um, the what also happens with apple cider vinegar so i'm going to leave i'm going to take one part plant and the plant is going to be dried and i'm going to put it into two parts oil and i'm going to leave it again for four weeks and then i'm going to strain the plant material out and then i can have a teaspoon in water before i eat to get my digestion going right or i can make my salad dressings with this beautiful wild plant infused um, vinegar. I can also put the yarrow in my apple cider vinegar for its mineral contents. I can use rose hips. I can use stinging nettles. I can use red clover. Um, who else? Yellow dock root, dandelion root. So here are these wild weeds that are growing around us that we're, you know, we, we were programmed to believe that they were no good or that, oh, you don't want those. But we forgot that this is really what our ancestors were eating. Um, and that's why the dandelion came over in the 15 and 1600s. And so, because I go into a lot of schoolyards and this is taken at Templeton High School prior to them putting in a garden on this cement pad, I took this image because wow, what an amazing, resilient plant that dandelion is, that she can grow in those little cracks. And also her teaching is reminding us that we too can be resilient like dandelion, that, that we're, we can walk through whatever we need to walk through like our ancestors did. And that this plant came over with all of the colonists and fur traders. So I'm a Métis, so my grandmothers were marrying those fur traders and those colonists. And these were the foods that my ancestors were eating that have traveled all over the planet that many ancestors have been eating. And dandelion only grows where there are people. So we don't find dandelion up in our forests. We don't find her in the jungles in Ecuador, which I, I, I traveled in a couple years ago and I looked for her. I found her in the cities in Ecuador, but I didn't find her in the jungle. So she grows with people. And what's beautiful about dandelion is that um, every part of the dandelion we can eat. The flower, the stem, the leaf, the root, and the, even the seed. So and each part of the dandelion has a, a different affinity to the body system. So um, the flower, also is good for pollinators, has vitamin D. So remembering that vitamin D we also get from the sun, which happens to be free. So we can get outside. And one of my teachers um, shared, uh, you know, depending on the color of your skin, you want to get outside and expose your arms and your face for 20 minutes a day so your body can absorb vitamin D. And if your skin is darker, then you would probably stay out longer because the, the, that melaton, that pigmentation, right, would take longer for the sun rays to go in for your body to absorb the vitamin D. And research actually tells us that people that, ha that have cancer have low amounts of vitamin D, right? We are nature. 
We are a living organism. We are of the same elements of this earth. So the earth provides and nourishes us and makes us strong and healthy so that we in turn can be the earth caretakers that we've always been. So, um, so dandelion, let's put it in some flowers, in some honey. Let's, uh, but oh, let's also, please, I just remember, let's make sure that when we start the harvest on the dandelion, one, we ask permission, but two, only take what we need. And that remember that there are a lot of insects that depend on the dandelion. So I can take, um, uh, the petal, add it to my smoothies, add it into my salads, you know, decorate my cakes, um, batter it up, add it into my pancake mixes. So there's lots of different ways that I can in, um, uh, enjoy her, her beauty and her goodness. Um, the leaf I, I want to mention uh, is also has an affinity to the kidneys and it um, helps to flush the kidneys and replace um, your body with potassium. But just like any plant, we also want to make sure we don't overuse something. We don't want to keep using something that that works as a diuretic over and over again. So we would just use it for a short period of time. We also want to be mindful. How does that respond for my body? And I always remind people that if you're on any type of medication, then you should check a site called WebMD for any contraindications. And, you know, something as simple as grapefruit, great, grapefruit, excuse me, can potentize your med medicines. Echinacea will potentize. Uh, St. John's wort will flush things very quickly through the kidney, uh, through the liver. So you never use St. John's wort when you're on birth control pills. So all of a sudden you start to dive deeper in an understanding of how these plants, because they're full of all these chemicals, what information are they bringing into my body system, right? So um, and the leaf can also be eaten and it's quite bitter and bitters are really important for our digestion because as we age, everything slows down and falls down. So if we can have some bitters and make sure everything's being um, digested and uh, so, you know, we just need a little more help as we age. That's just the reality of this process of life. And um and one of the teachings that I remind the kids is that as the two leggeds, we move the seeds. So I'm sure all of us remember blowing those seed heads everywhere when we were children. And we intrinsically know that we are here to help move the seeds, right? And that's what we've always done is we work in that act of reciprocity. And then who else? Another part of the dandelion is the root. And oh my goodness, what amazing gifts of calcium and iron and beta carotenes and inulin. And inulin helps to stabilize blood sugars. And I've been challenged with too much blood sugars in my body. So I've really had to change my diet and um, get off my sugars and my wheat, which I also recognize are um, you know, don't have some good history behind them. So they're not from sugars, not even really a food, right? Sugar cane is a food, but not sugar. And um, that I can find my sweetness in other ways, right? I can, you know, use honey or maple syrup, but I can also cultivate sweetness, right? I can make things with my hands and that comes from my heart, which is made with sweetness. So love is sweetness, so we can, we can really, you know, change a lot of um, um, relationships around us in, in all those choices. So dandelion's helping to restabilize and balance my, my sugars in my body. And um, you can eat her fresh. 
you can roast her up, you can throw her in the oven, you can grind her, make coffee. Um, you know, it's unbelievably delicious. The more you have bitters, the more you crave bitters. So it's an, also an education on our palate um, with the dandelion root. And this plant is going at least a, a, a meter into the earth. So again, as I said, it's pulling out these minerals, it's helping with aeration, it's helping with drainage, it's a home to many uh, insects, right? Every time you pull out the dandelion, you'll find lots of insects in amongst and around and underneath her. So um, she's a good guest because she brings food and she brings medicine. And as I said, so many of our ancestors and she was adopted by many nations as she's traveled across uh, Turtle Island in part of our mythology or stories of my history is we refer to North America as Turtle Island. And um, so she's a good reminder how to be. So a little witch hazel, maybe you notice some um, uh, coming out prior to the snow. <laughs> And um, it, she's just a, a beautiful gift that is incredibly fragrant. And um, so we want to also be having beauty in our in our garden. So we can also make some medicine for the skin. She's very astringent. And um, I just love this image, this this wild yellow hairdo on this beautiful blue sky. Um, and, the, you know, what happens when we are witnessing nature, how it makes us feel, right? What all of those, those gifts of beauty and love. So here's another fairly common um, wild weed referred to as chickweed. And um, it, it's kind of hard, sorry, I don't think my screen's so clear, this computer, it, I, I needed a new computer and I refused to buy a new one, so I bought a used one. And so I can see it's not that really the best, but right here is a tiny little white flower. So again, an important plant for pollinators. And we have native bees that have little tongues, they're called proboscis. So the our native bees have actually adapted to this particular weed because we've taken out some of the, a lot of our indigenous plants, um, like what would be one that has a little flower, evergreen huckleberry has a little flower. And I don't see a lot of it growing around the city. So, you know, if we were all growing that, and that's a great one to grow in pots and on balconies, you can have um, providing food for all these little wingeds, but also you will get this incredible little berry for yourself. So going back to chickweed, sorry, that just popped in. So I had to tell you. So, um, and again, we want to find the identification. So really making sure, and what I'm just trying to point out here is there's a little bit of hair. It's kind of like a little bit of mohawk on the stem, but it's on a different side of the stem once it passes the leaf structure there. And that is a good indication. So you know you're with chickweed, which is uh, uh, Stella Rhea media. I believe that's how I say it. And she's a wonderful green, comes in the spring. She likes the cooler weather and the warming sun. We'll see her again in the fall. She's probably in your garden. You didn't know who she was. So you've been tearing her out or putting poison. She's working as a living mulch. She is high in tons of minerals and vitamins, but she also has a, a chemical component known as saponins. And saponins help to pull toxins out of the body. So here is a plant that's coming in the spring that's helping us to remember that rhythm of these spring foods to get into our spring foods to help clear out all that heaviness we've been eating over the winter months. All the meat and all the cheeses and all the breads. And we start to move into a different diet as we go into the spring. So um, she's great for inflammation on the inside of the body. She also helps with inflammation on the outside of the body. And I can 
infuser into my healing skin salve. So I'm going to dry the plant, infuse it in the oil, and then I can um, then melt it with some beeswax and then use that on my skin to help with um, inflammation. We don't see this plant around here in Vancouver much. There's only a couple places that I know of uh, seeing uh, the stinging nettle. And um, she is such an important plant. There are five different species of butterfly that lay their eggs on this plant. And if we don't create um, habitat for hosting the butterflies, we are losing them rapidly. Um, I have nettles growing on one side of my house. So I have my spring green. Um, this is unbelievably high in minerals and vitamins. We can make uh, cordage, fishing nets were made with stinging nettles. Um, we can think about it for fibers and weaving. Um, it, it, the seeds we can collect in the fall, they're a, considered a superfood. So we have this beautiful spring green that is so delicious, so high in minerals for us. Also make teas. And then we get another food source in the fall. Um, so I, I love stinging nettle. It reminds me of when I was a kid. And, um, you know, I don't mind being stung when I harvest. I always harvest with my bare hands. So I make sure I don't over harvest. Recognizing being uh, having part of this human experience is I can be greedy. So I need uh, uh, a reminder to only take what I need. So that's part why I always use my hands, use my bare hands. But not only that is all of that stinging that you can see in this image, those little barbs are full of formic acid and they actually help to release um, beta endorphins out of the brain and flood the body. So even though that feels uncomfortable, it actually is good for the body it helps with circulation. We can we can take um, a stem and we can, you know, uh, hit it on those parts where the arthritis is to again move everything. Right? It's it's a buildup of acid. So what might we be eating that is creating that acid buildup in our body? So circulation is really important to make sure we're getting good iron and oxygen and all the other. Um, minerals that we're made up of. And here we have, um, this is English daisy, another beautiful introduced species that um, the little bees have adapted to. And as I said, if you have a lawn, how beautiful that you would look out on that green space and you would see beautiful yellow dandelion flowers that now you could be doing some harvesting, that you've got these beautiful English daisies, you've got uh, yarrow growing, you, you've got some plantain. These are all amazing wild foods that you can now be putting into your diet that you're going to be buying less from the grocery store. You're going to have more for yourself and you're going to actually feel better because the, the foods that are being grown are lacking in nutritional value because we've GMO'd them. We've destroyed the soil. We've destroyed the living organism. And now we're growing food just with chemicals. Um, so, you know, I don't know about you, and I tell the kids all the time, I want to live until I'm 102. I want to be here, be, be part of the solution, find those new systems that we, we need to really consider moving into the future. And, um, and, and to remember that we're nature, that this is our inherent right to be in this relationship. Um, in this web. And um, so with the English daisy pot herb, we can throw it in our soups and our stews, right into our salads. I can infuse that, that flower into the oil. And um, it's part of the same family as Arnica. So I can use it for sore muscles. So I can get a food source, or I can 
use it as a medicine when I have sore muscles, right? And who doesn't love a good massage, right? So let's have some beautiful oils to massage each other and, and, and help each other when we get stiff from all that work of working in the garden. So this one is strawberry. And um, we find strawberry all over North America. So another beautiful plant that really um, connects us. And um, strawberry has the teaching around forgiveness. And that's an important way. And that's another reason why I love to share about plants and our ecology is what, what are we being told? What are we being shown? What have we forgotten? Right. And, you know, the truth is we're just one big, huge human family and we have not always been kind to each other. So we can, you know, start these practices of forgiveness and then really take ourselves into the next part of our evolution. Um, the leaf of the strawberry can be harvested before the flower. And this again is high in a vitamin C. And we know vitamin C helps prevent scurvy, right? The colonists, when they came over, um, they all had scurvy. And the first people, my, my ancestors, we made beautiful tea. We, we made them tea from the evergreen boughs of, of pine that's high in vitamin C. Here's another plant that has vitamin C. So um, vitamin C is helping with our bone, not our bones, our muscles, with our heart, for our immune system. So when we get that sore throat, that's the, our body's intelligence telling us, I need some vitamin C. I need you to rest. I need you to drink lots of fluids. And, you know, this virus is teaching us that when we're not well, regardless of whether we have a virus, stay home, take care of yourself, slow down, right? And, and, um, and, and give that to your body, to your community, um, so you can get well again. And the berries, oh my goodness, these are like the most amazing berries in the whole wide world. And when do they come out? They come out in June. So strawberries are not every day, every, you know, every year, you know, every day of the year. That's what I'm trying to say. They are from in June and they actually help with allergies. So we get a lot of people with allergies in June and guess what? Strawberries could be helpful unless of course you're allergic to strawberries. Um, so, and you know, kids love looking. So grandchildren growing this in our gardens. So our children learn how to harvest in a good way and to be patient and to find forgiveness. This is flowering red currant. So one of our, our native plants and um, really important for our, our hummingbirds, right? It's a beautiful um, medicine or, or nectar for hummingbirds. And I remind the kids, be mindful. You know, um, some of the stories are, if you, if you pick this flower, it will rain. And I think that was just to help the children to not pick all the flowers so that there would be food for all of those other species with us. So I, I love that reminder, you know, we have to be mindful that we're making sure everybody is strong and healthy around us. The more our environment is strong and healthy, the more strong and healthy we are. And the virus comes out of a place that is very polluted, has no environmental laws. People are working in factories, making things that are being shipped to us over here in the West. So, um, you know, how do we really keep our environment healthy, not just here, but the whole planet? Because we recognize when it's, when it's dirty and polluted, it's going to affect all of us. Salmonberry, um, spring food, uh, you know, amazing berry. And uh, I was, I don't know if I said it here, I, I've been doing a couple teachings today, but, um, you know, again, that 
thought of why are we not eating the foods of this land? How does that shape us? Right? Um, what teachings come from for us? Uh, and and why not? They're so delicious, right? And the birds get to eat them as well. So we've, we've got to make sure we've got this wild space, but that we can also bring this into our garden. So with my camellia, I have uh, salmonberry growing in, in my garden, right? And, and always recognizing you want to have the right place for the right plant or the right plant for the right place, right? So, you know, get to know what they need so they are going to be thriving with you. And, and here's a beautiful basket of these amazing berries that come in all different colors. Um, that what a gift. And when I'm in the berry patch, then I need to prune, right? I need to um, uh, listen to when I'm being told to leave the patch. So I have this rule, when I drop three berries, I have to leave. That's it for the day, right? So again, like I said, you know, all of us have that, that uh, these human qualities, attributes, shadows, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, yeah, sometimes we don't always remember how to behave. So we need these teachings of the plants and the animals to help us remember. Wild plum. There's another beautiful native plant that we can be growing in our garden, right? We want to have at least 50% and a great food source for the birds. And I will tell you this little berry when it's dried, taking it right off the, off the stem is so delicious, but it doesn't have a lot of uh, a fruit to it. It's more of a seed than it is a fruit. And then you can see the, the beautiful purples that are really important for our brain. So these dark colors that we want to make sure we're eating lots of uh, like a rainbow of colors of food in our diet. Here's um, Oregon grape and her beautiful yellow flower that comes in the spring. And in Chinese medicine, yellow represents the cleansing of the liver. Right. So in the spring, we start to think about cleaning the liver and then this beautiful berry that comes in uh, what July, August, very sour, um, very high in vitamin C because any food that's sour tasting is an indication of vitamin C and that vitamin C gives us energy. Right, so here's a, a beautiful way to prop ourselves up instead of drinking coffee from a, a long ways away. And don't get me wrong, I love coffee like everyone else. Um, but recognizing all those choices too have an imprint. And what's a good substitute that tastes really delicious? Dandelion root as a coffee substitute. And here's her beautiful berries. So I love to make some jams with her with her berries. So this is an easy plant to grow in our gardens, in our boulevards, on the edges of parks, at the community centers, at the school grounds. So we make this accessible in our urban landscape versus us going into the woods to do the harvest, which we want to leave for the bears and the cougars and the wolverines and, and the other species. Here's um, some images of thimbleberry and her beautiful white flower. And um, again, just another one that's uh, pretty prevalent. And, and I've seen it growing in the boulevards around the city. And then the garden caretakers who had some, you know, um, gardens in the center of the, of the intersection, they didn't really know this plant and they actually dug it all up. So I see that lots of education we can you know, change the, the narrative, the landscape, and then have wild foods and medicines growing around and having harvesting corridors. This is um, Uva Ursi, Kanik Kanik. So the, at, at this stage, she's got um, uh, a green berry, but it's at a red stage. And she's quite an interesting tasting berry. And she has an amazing medicine Whoops, she has an amazing medicine um, that helps to um, disinfect the urinary tract and system. But it's a very strong medicine. 
So, you know, the, what I what I want everyone to know is that, you know, as you start this journey that your ancestors knew, the plants, um, we we feel a little nervous about it because we've been imprinted that, you know, oh no, we go to the doctor and then we go to the pharmacy and, and this is the way that we do it. And we've actually forgotten these ancient practices of learning the plants and knowing the plants. Uh, seeing the night sky and knowing the teachings of the constellations or of the planetary movements, um, how to dream. Many indigenous cultures have dreaming practices that actually help to shape them and inform them about their living world. Um, uh, yeah, ancient practices, plants are one of that, right? Knowing who we can eat. Um, I, I took this with a macro uh, camera that I could put on my phone. This was a couple years ago, our beautiful um, bumblebees. And again, you know, um, bees are responding to a different temperature when they come out to do pollination. And um, honeybees are an introduced crop. So we, we need to make sure that the environment is going to support the, um, you know, who are our natives, right? Who is indigenous here on this land? Um, all species, all nations. Elderberry flower makes a beautiful cordial. All the rest of this plant is poisonous. So again, you know, um, IDing is important. So get a good ID book, uh, a good app, right? Go out with people. There are others that, you know, teach about the wild plants. Um, and, and so that way you can, you know, make good decisions, keep yourself safe, and then think about, oh, I'm really enjoying this. I really should grow it in my own yard, that I should grow it, you know, get permission and, and grow it on the edges of these parks so we can all have access. Bleeding heart, and one of one, another one of our, our native plants that we can get food and medicine from. Um, viola, another one of our native plants. So, you know, sometimes we go, oh, these aren't so important. And, and, and I'll let you know, I'm just gonna go back here one sec. Um, on, the, um, on, the, uh, on the trails going into Pacific Spirit Park, I would see some other invasive that would be crowding out our native plant. So that's that reminder of, oh, let's make sure the invasive ones or the, the opportunist ones are not crowding out the native plants, especially in those wild spaces. Um, so I'd pull out, what was it called? Himalayan orchid, or I think there were some other names I'm trying to remember. And so every time I came by, I just kept pulling them out. And what I noticed by the end of the summer, that there was space for the, the bleeding heart to start to show up again. So again, what are our responsibilities here to ensure that um, everybody's here? And the viola is edible and early, early spring flower, and, um, and just beautiful to have in our garden. And here is the, the evergreen tips of the Douglas fir, so part of the pine family. And that bright green tip, I can infuse in honey, I can make beautiful teas. I'm getting um, my vitamin C from this um, beautiful gift. Um, I can chew on her when I'm out hiking and get that, you know, that surge of energy. Um, and again, I just want to make sure I'm not over harvesting here, right? That I'm just taking a little to enjoy for myself and not over harvesting. This one, sorry, this image is not the best. This is miner's lettuce. And we can be growing this in our garden. So I caretake a, a garden up at Moberly Arts and Cultural Center. So I've got a little bit of this just starting in the garden and hopefully she'll start to spread more. So we, we need to make sure, just like Caroline was talking about, you know, bringing back the camas and, you know, 
they, they were, I remember reading something not too long ago, they were describing as the colonists were coming around um, into in, in, uh, around that point in Victoria, that whole hillside, Beacon Hill Park was covered in a sea of blue. And what they wrote in their journal was, oh, that's gonna be a perfect place for us to start farming. That was a food source for the first people, right? So we can, we can bring this back again and we can be growing that for our indigenous brothers and sisters of this land, but we can also grow it for ourselves, right? We can share that beautiful gift. Um, this is mock orange, one of my favorite um, smelly flowers which is a local flower. I feel like I'm in the tropics when I smell her, but she's also an important host plant. Skunk cabbage, we can also get some, some food from, but um, also an important part for the insects, right? For the ecosystem, for the bears to be able to chew on those roots that uh, stimulate their, their gallbladder after their hibernation. Because if, if we get lots of snow, then those bears are gonna hibernate and that's what they need to do. And the teaching of the bear and the hibernation, like the winter reminder is, how can I take less from the environment when things are so scarce that the my other brothers and sisters of the of the rabbit and the you know uh, the fox or the the coyote or the wolf that's still living over the winter months that I make myself smaller so that they can have access to less you know food that is available. I just learned this teaching recently about the bear. And I thought, wow, that's a good reminder. How, how is it that I can shrink my ecological footprint? How can I be in service to my living world? Um, what I'm, where I'm calling my home. These are blueberries. These are alpine blueberries. This is an image I took up at, um, Mount Washington a couple years ago when, when my nieces and nephew came from Ontario. And we drove right up to the top of the mountain and there were fields of wild blueberries. And I was in awe. And I was like, wow, we can do this. We can grow fields. You know, there are many, many fields on uh, around here in Vancouver of blueberries. And we know through the research, they're so important for our brain. Fireweed, here's another weed that we, we consider, you know, oh, don't put that in your garden. She'll, she'll take over and she'll spread everywhere. But this is a pioneer plant. This is an important plant that is instrumental in uh, our ecology when our environment is disturbed by forest fires and earthquakes and volcanoes erupting. So her seed can lay dormant in the earth until that moment. So we actually wanna make sure that we have her growing around us and that her seed is in the earth. So when those moments happen, that we know that the, that the processes can be, um, are there in place. And she's amazing food for the bees. She's delicious. I can make jellies with her. I can eat the spring shoots. I can use her for fibers. I can dig up the roots. Good for inflammation for the prostate gland. Um, I can make beautiful teas. And this was a tea that was common all on the circumpolar region of the planet prior to tea being brought from China. So this was, you know, uh, an, an important food source and, and um, gift to all Indigenous cultures living at that part of the planet, of the globe. And I do, I love taking macro shots. So this is my little artsy fartsy um, pictures of here's her little stamens and pistons. And it's like, wow, just a, amazing beauty. And here's another one, a, a bee. Uh, again, I don't have a lot of these images, but I'm like, wow, look at that pollen stuck on, on her fur, right? 
So doing with time, I'm at 840. And um, if there's one plant I want to start stop with, this probably might be the one. Um, so I'm just kind of doing a check in. How are we doing, Carolyn? Everything okay, Dennis? Shall we, um, you know, I could just do this one last one, or we can carry on a little bit more. How are, how are you doing there? And is there any kind of questions or uh, that's in the chat that I might want to also answer? Well, maybe I could keep keep uh, five minutes or less, and 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 then we'll have time for questions. Okay, good. Okay, then I'll I'll just finish with this one. So and and let me hopefully. Oh, good, good. So there's two of them here. The first one here is called Plantago lancelata. The second one is called Plantago major. So same species right, uh, family of Plantago. And this one is probably more common than the first one, but we see them both known as ribwort, plantain, um, uh, white man's footprint is what was first called when it arrived. And because of these seed stalks that you can see in this image, all those seeds would get caught in the bottom of, of the, the settlers shoes and, and under their feet. And many would show up wherever we walked. And again, these wild weeds do not grow in the wild. They only grow with us. And the reason I called them wild is because they're not domesticated, right? Nobody's intentionally usually planting them. Maybe I am, but most people are not. And that the, spe the seeds are, you know, being spread because they're in service to make sure that the earth is not lay laying barren. Because then the sunlight kills the microorganisms in the soil. So they're actually in service. And um, these seeds are high in protein. And this leaf, when it's small, we can be putting it into salads. It's got um, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin K, potassium. We can make dry it, make teas. It's very good for the lungs. So when we have congestion in the lungs, it can help support our lungs. Um, and we can also take this leaf that's very distinctive and chew it if we get an insect bite, a spider bite, right? A mosquito bite, a sting, and it's gonna neutralize the venom going into the body. We can also dry it and put it in the oil and I can make it for those healing skin salves. So it also turns out the, the plantain, and I'm just gonna go back to this image. The plantain is, um, uh, also where certain butterflies will lay their eggs. So it's, it's come with medicine. It's come with food. It's a host plant for insects. Um, it takes up a small amount of space and, um, it can, you know, not only nourish us, but nourish all the other species that live here. And you can collect these seeds, you can give them to your birds, you can give them to your rabbits, um, you know, you can feed, um, we can feed ourselves, right? We can have our medicines and um, such, such an amazing um, gift. I know I've been saying gift all night, but really just, oh, spit poultice, yes. And you put it on a bite. And yes, you can eat it. You can eat it when it's small. When it gets larger, it gets very fibrous. But we can add that into our wild salads, right? Um, one of my favorite dishes is actually dandelion stem. So I love to cut that up and fry it with butter and garlic and then mix in my scrambled eggs. And so for about a two-week period, I'm eating a lot of the stems and I haven't tried it yet, but you can make those stems into your spaghetti noodles. So if you've got an abundant, um, for sure. Yes, yes. And stinging nettle is two different families, the dead and the stinging. Um, the dead nettle, um, you can make some tea with the dead nettle, the purple dead nettle. And um, it's very good for allergies and it has a lot of healing modalities. And what I would, 
let you also know is what I've been doing tonight is just starting to give you um, an overview. I can't tell you everything about every plant, but just to get you going and getting you curious. Oh, who is growing outside my door? Because my teacher always said, whoever's growing in abundance around you is most likely your ally or your medicine.